Welcome back. Well, for women the world over, reaching their 50s is a milestone, a turning point, if you like. It can bring renewed energy and contentment, as well as fresh challenges and angst. Some women say as they age, they feel increasingly liberated and self-assured, while others have a sense of irrelevance and at times feel invisible post-50. We thought we'd have a look back at what life has been like for the women aged over 50. It's been eventful. Here's a taste. Well, let's face it, bars I think were originally intended for men to drink at. How do you feel about women being allowed into this bar? I don't like it. The 1960s and 1970s, a time of change, challenges to the status quo and the rise of women's liberation. Society would change forever. The girls of the Women's Liberation Group are organising themselves. What you're seeing is a revolution in the money king. Well, it seems to me that what you're really saying is that you men are superior in every way to all women. Um, pretty well. That's putting it very simplistically, but basically, yeah. As the movement gathered momentum, their voices demanded to be heard. The government has neglected women. I shan't pretend to you that any government can achieve immediately for Australian women the revolution required to allow them to develop fully as individuals. Women's Electoral Lobby and the Women's Liberation Group have made government and people and women themselves aware of their problems and have become sensitive to a whole wide range of issues affecting women. Much was achieved equal pay legislation, free contraception, legalised abortion and maternity leave. These women went on to have more independence than their mothers ever dreamt of back in the 1940s and 50s. They were a new generation, one that managed families and careers. But it wasn't the same for everyone. Some missed the chance for educational career and now this generation is aged 55 plus facing a whole new set of challenges. Well, joining me this morning for today's agenda is author, novelist, broadcaster and columnist and mother and grandmother, I might add, Jane Carrow. Jane, good morning to you. Morning. Congratulations on this new book, Accidental Feminists. You Thank set you. out to, to highlight exactly what women now aged in their 50s, 60s and 70s have achieved. When you look back at, at, at that vision, um, it's important to recognise how much they achieved in a short space of time. Really incredible. They're a revolutionary generation. Um, they're the first generation of women in the history of the world to have mostly earned their own money for most of their lives. Mm. But they didn't set out to change the world. That wasn't their intention. They thought their lives was going to, were going to be like every generation of women before them. And it was technology. It was the pill. It was the tampon, which we never give enough credit to. Mm. Um, and, of course, the paycheck that made that difference. That's why I've called this book Accidental Feminist. And it's the story of their generation. That being said, though, where are they at now? What, what is your observation, having spoken to so many women in writing this book? Where are they sitting? How are they feeling? Well, it's, it's interesting. It's almost as if it's a tale of two fates. There's a group of women who are doing really well. They've got money. They've got time because if they've had children, they've grown up, those responsibilities are no longer so onerous. And they're deciding to have some fun. And they're spending their own money, not their inheritance, not the housekeeping, the money they earned. They're sitting pretty and they're a market and people are really interested in them so I think we might see a lot more of older women than we have done in the past but unfortunately there's a very far too big a group of women for whom that is not reality mm. the fastest growing group amongst the homeless is women over 55 mm. so we have um, a generation of women who have tried to do everything they were asked to do they've tried to um, do the caring as they were always expected to, but also were expected to go out to work and earn some money. But the caring responsibilities interrupted the ability to make money, often employed part-time, often in low-skilled jobs. Mm. They have not accumulated superannuation. If their marriage split up, they often did very badly financially out of it. And they find themselves in their 50s, un fired from the jobs they do have, unable to get new jobs because of ageism, and suddenly they're worried about keeping a roof over their head. Mm. This is no reward for a lifetime of hard work and taking all the caring responsibilities on their shoulders. We have to start changing things radically to stop this continuing to happen. Well, I want to ask you how we go about that because you'd be familiar with the term sandwich generation. Yes. These are the women who are still caring for, for older children. They're caring for ageing parents. They're running a household. They're holding down a job. They feel invisible. They feel forgotten. Mm. Uh, they're turning, and exhausted. They're <laughs> exhausted. They're turning in greater numbers than ever to alcohol. Mm. So that they have a great sense of guilt 
um, about, and shame about that. What can we do better to, to, to help these women? Well, I think the first thing we have to recognise is that caring responsibilities should not be assumed to be women's work. And housework should not be assumed to be women's work. We can't ask women to do three jobs and men one. Women doing childcare and aged care, housework and paid work, and men just doing paid work. Sorry, not on anymore. Got to stop. That's the first thing. The other thing is we can do things like when people take time out to care for others out of the work paid workforce, men or women, when they take time out, why the government should pay their super whilst they're out of the workforce. Because otherwise, every time somebody gives up their own income to look after others, they run the risk of being in poverty in their old age. And that is no reward for actually saving taxpayers, the health system, a, a fortune by taking on caring responsibilities. We need to look at ways that we do not actually achieve equal pay. Because that stops women from accumulating enough money to look after themselves in their old age. We have to re-look at the way we parcel out the work that needs to be done in our community to look after people and to earn our own money. We can't say to women, it's your job to look after others, oh, but you have to take care of yourself as well. And if you haven't got enough money, it's because you didn't lean in. That is not a good enough excuse. We cannot afford not to look no. after them. Which leads me to my next question. When today's young women shy away from being labelled a feminist. They say the whole notion of it just doesn't relate to them and their experiences. Some go so far as to say it's a dirty word. What's your response to that? It's nothing new. Young women have rarely been the, been the age group that identify as feminists. Now, some do, and good for them, because I don't want to generalise about all young women. Of course. But in general, it's our life experience that turns us into feminists. The interesting thing about the women I interviewed for this book is that most of them said when they were young they didn't even think about feminism or any of that kind of stuff. And it would never have crossed their minds to identify that way. But now, in their 50s and 60s, they're all identifying as feminists because Women, and I understand it, young women have hope. They think, I'm going to be judged by the contents of my character, not the contents of my knickers. I'm going to, you know, my educational achievement is going to be taken seriously. Men have out, uh, women have outperformed men in education for over 100 years now. And um, I'm going to be judged on my merits. And then, particularly if they have children, the scales fall from their eyes and they find that they are being asked to do all this extra work that most men are not asked to do. Now, that doesn't mean some men don't do it. That some wonderful men do, mm. but they're not asked to, they're not expected to. You know, if you're a working, um, you're in the paid workforce and you're looking after a house and children and people come round and your house looks like a bomb's gone off in it, they don't think to themselves, oh, that, you know, Fred's a terrible housekeeper. Mm. It's still our responsibility and that starts to weigh on women and so I understand young women thinking it's changed this is the past tragically the statistics I quote in this book say no we still have a long way to go and the, every single older woman who is now facing the prospect of living out of her car is an absolute clarion call that feminism mm. is still necessary absolutely this is a really fa I mean you I've always been a huge admirer of your of your uh, writing but this is, I, I think, a, a, a book that everyone should read, men and women. Thank you so much. I could talk all day, but we're out of time, Jane <laughs> Thanks, Carey. Thank Jody. you so much for being here. Over to you, Deb. Plenty right. there to think about. I'm grabbing that book off you. Don't you worry about that. Good on you. Thank you, ladies.